Hey Tigers, this is your digital reteach for Newton's Laws of Motion. This reteach will specifically address Texas Essential Knowledge and Skill 8.6c, and that is to investigate and describe applications of Newton's Law of Inertia, Law of Force and Acceleration, and Law of Action Reaction, such as in vehicle restraints, sports activities, amusement park rides, Earth's tectonic activities, and rocket launches. Now it's important that you understand how you're going to get credit for this reteach. Your teacher should have given you a Cornell Notes worksheet, and that is what you're going to use while you watch this video. You need to make sure you take notes, answer any of the questions, and write your summary. When you're finished, show that completed Cornell Notes worksheet to your teacher. They will give you information about the next retest. All right, let's begin. The first section of our notes talks about the law of inertia. Before we get into the law, just think about that word inertia. It's going to come up a lot. The basic law says that it, this is the tendency of an object in motion to stay in motion, and it'll do so moving in a straight line forever. Or this will also be an object that is at rest, and it's going to stay at rest forever. It'll never change. So inertia really means a resistance to change. The origin of the word actually comes from an old word for lazy. So inertia and lazy are similar terms. So let's look at this law in detail. It really has two parts. The first part of the law says an object at rest remains at rest. So think about any object you want. If it's just sitting there, that object is never going to move. Or think about an object that's in motion. It will stay in motion and it's going to keep going at a constant speed and in a straight line unless some unbalanced force acts upon the object and it makes it change. Same thing with the object at rest. It'll stay there forever at rest unless an unbalanced force makes it change what it's doing. So when we think about inertia, it has a direct tie-in with the mass of the object. So the more mass that an object has, the more inertia the object has. Long story short, Bigger objects with more mass are going to be much harder to start and stop. Try to imagine a little marble that's rolling at you down a hill. You know, no matter how big that hill is, that little marble is going to be pretty easy to stop. It doesn't have a lot of inertia because it doesn't have a lot of mass. So it only has a little bit of laziness. Now think of a big, huge boulder that's six feet tall. If that starts rolling down a mountain, that is going to be incredibly hard to stop. So not that the boulder is lazy, but it's not going to want to change what it's doing. That's inertia. Inertia doesn't want to change. So once that boulder starts moving really quickly, it does not want to stop. It can hit something pretty hard and keep going. So here's some examples that you can think of for the law of inertia that you may have done in class or you can just think of now. If you have a chair or a cart that's loaded with books, you can push that chair and that cartload of books and get that going. It wants to keep going in a straight line forever. But when it crashes, the chair will stop and the books will continue to fly on because the books want to keep going. They don't want to change what they're doing. I know a lot of teachers like to use the baby in the car seat example or they'll set a baby in a toy baby in a stroller. A lot of teachers will do a toy car and a coin sitting on top. It's the same idea. If you put a coin on top of a toy car and you get it going really fast in a straight line, inertia says that both the coin and the car want to keep going forever. But if the car crashes and stops, the coin keeps flying. It keeps moving in that straight line. It has inertia. It doesn't want to change. Roller coasters are classic examples of inertia. Once the roller coaster starts going down the first big hill, it really wants to keep going down at a straight line forever. But the track twists and turns, and that's waiting as those different forces apply to it. So the track will make the roller coaster change, but it really didn't want to. Seat belts in your car are a great example. If you've ever been riding in your car with your parents, you're going down the road, something jumps out in front of the car, and they have to hit the brakes really hard. Well, it feels like you fly forward. In a way, you do. The car has stopped, basically. And your body has inertia, it has mass, your body wants to keep going. And it wants to keep flying through the windshield, but hopefully the seatbelt grabs onto you and pulls you back into the car. 
Another classic example that's sometimes done in classes, if you take a stack of metal washers or metal coins, you stack them up perfectly straight, and you flick one coin into the bottom of that stack. If you do it perfectly, the stack has inertia. It's lazy. It doesn't want to move. And if you do this really quickly, the bottom coin will fly out of the stack, and the rest of the stack will just fall right back into place and make it look like it never moved. Another classic example is if you take a penny and you place it on top of a playing card and you put that on top of a cup. The penny has inertia. It does not want to move. And if you can flick that playing card off of there quick enough, the penny is stuck in midair because it didn't want to move. And then, of course, gravity takes over and it falls in the cup. Let's go into our next law, sometimes called the second law. The name is the law of force and acceleration. So on this one, it basically says the acceleration of an object will depend on the mass of the object and the amount of force that is applied on the object. This is the law that you have the formula force equals mass times acceleration. That formula is always on your formula chart that will be on the back of your periodic table. We have to give that to you on a test, and the state of Texas has to give it to you on the STAR test as well. Now, if we think about what acceleration really means, for us, acceleration is a change in velocity. So anytime velocity changes, we say there was acceleration. In high school, they'll go into much further detail, but for now, we're going to leave it that simple. So if we remember velocity as one of our vocabulary words, we know velocity is basically speed and also a direction that something is going. So if an object changes speed, we can say the acceleration has changed or it has accelerated. Or even if an object stays at the same speed but just the direction changes, then there is acceleration. Mass of the object is simply the amount of matter in an object. And you've used that since sixth grade at least. So when we think about acceleration and force, they are related to one another. If we keep the mass of the object the same, then we can say the more force there is, there'll be more acceleration. And that makes sense. Try to imagine your best friend is sitting in a chair and you want them to accelerate quicker. Well, the first time you push them, you might just push a little bit and they'll accelerate a little bit, but they don't accelerate very quickly. The second time, you apply a lot of force, and then they accelerate much quicker. That's really how you know you're looking at a force and acceleration law question. You really almost have to compare two things. What happens if I change more force? What happens if I change the mass of the object? What happens if I change the acceleration? If you're comparing two of those and you're changing one, you're probably talking about the law of force and acceleration. So another way to look at this, we know that the more mass there is, that's going to be more inertia, and therefore an object will take more force to make it move. That just makes sense. If you've got a really super duper tiny friend that's, say, in third grade, it's not going to take much force to get them to move if you shove them out of the way. And then if you have a really big friend in high school that's really tall, really athletic, weighs a lot, has a lot of mass, it's going to take a lot more force to move them in the same way. Here's some examples of the law of force and acceleration you might have seen. Flicking different coins. If you could flick with the exact amount of force, you should notice a different amount of acceleration. You know, if we flick a small penny compared to a large quarter, we're changing the mass. We'll see the acceleration change if we use the same force. An empty chair versus a loaded chair. Kind of talked about that earlier. If you push on an empty chair, it accelerates quite easily. If the chair is loaded down and it has a lot of mass, using the same force, we won't see the same amount of acceleration. A classic example of this could be a big moving van and a Mini Cooper. If the big moving van needs to get going, if it's stalled on the side of the road, you put it in neutral, it's going to take a lot more force because it has a lot more mass to accelerate that van out of the way. Now, the Mini Cooper is still a car. It's still going to have a good amount of mass to it but it's going to take a lot less force to push the Mini Cooper out of the way and get it to accelerate. Very simpler, or very simply, football games, athletic sports, all these are classic examples of force and acceleration. If you've got a small blocker that's trying to stop a large running back, 
there's a good chance that large running back is just going to run him over. He's going to accelerate him out of the way. He's got a lot of mass, and therefore he carries a lot of force with him. Even in baseball, if the batter bunts the ball, he barely accelerates the bat at all. And therefore, when the baseball hits it, there's not a whole lot of acceleration. Think about that versus a home run hit. There, the batter is using a tremendous amount of force as he hits the same baseball that had the same mass as the guy bunting, but now the ball accelerates much quicker and leaves the ballpark. Okay, so for problems that involve force, motion, and acceleration, you do need a little bit of math here, but the good news is it's math you've been doing since sixth grade. So a lot of these things you'll be very familiar with. So let's start with the formula force equals mass times acceleration. You have this formula on your formula chart, so there's no need to worry about memorizing it. You always have it handy. So let's go through this problem. A boy pushes on a box of mass that has 14 kilograms and it moves at an acceleration of four meters per second squared. With what force does the boy push the box? So if I'm looking at this formula and I'm thinking back to math class, one of the early things I should see is this is a, propor a proportional relationship. And therefore we know direct variation applies. Now that might come in handy for other problems, but this problem is pretty straightforward. If we just go ahead and substitute the numbers in that we do have, we know we're looking for force. So that's nice. The variable's already isolated. It said the mass was 14. So we're going to multiply that by the acceleration, which was four. Now I'm going to rewrite this so that it's more to my liking. So it's a vertical math problems. And at that point, it's just a matter of working it out. So four times four is 16. Throw the one over here. Four times one is four. Add the one, I got five. There's my answer, 56. So that will have 56 newtons of force. Now, if we look at a different sample problem, the same basic idea applies. Start with the formula that you're already given. You're always given force equals mass times acceleration. So this sample problem says, if a force of 4,000 newtons can move a crate at an acceleration of four meters per second squared, what is the mass of the object? All right, so if I start to substitute my numbers in, it said force was 4,000. So we'll write that in here. And then I don't know what the mass is, so I'll leave the M for mass. And it told me the acceleration was four. So my new equation is 4,000 equals the mass times four. Now at this point, I would like to isolate this variable. I don't like having mass over here by itself. So to isolate that variable, I need to do the inverse operation. Since this is multiplying, the inverse of that is dividing. So I'm going to divide by four on both sides of the equation. At this point, now we're in pretty good shape. It'll cross that out, and I can see that 4,000 divided by 4 is going to simply be 1,000. So the mass of that object, the mass of that crate, is 1,000. So the only thing that's a little bit more difficult, if you want to say, is just I had to isolate the variable in this case. But still, doing some basic math that I've been doing in math class since sixth grade, this is very easy to do. Let's try one more. This one says calculate the acceleration of a 250 kilogram airplane when the thrust of its engine is 500 newtons. All right, once again, always start with the formula. It'll make your life a lot easier. So force equals mass times the acceleration. All right, now I'm ready to start substituting my numbers in. It told me the force is 500, so that's easy enough. Substitute that in. Now, it didn't use the word force here, but I know that newtons 
is the unit for force. And that's how I know this number is 500. Same thing. I'm trying to find the acceleration and I know that the unit for mass is kilograms. So I know that this is going to be 250 for the mass. We'll times that by acceleration. Once again, I don't like the fact that acceleration, the variable is with other stuff. So I want to isolate that variable. So same thing, I need to do the inverse operation. So I'm multiplying here, the inverse is to divide. So I'm going to divide that by 250. And I got to do the same thing on the other side of the equation, 250. Now the problem becomes very simple. That'll eliminate itself and leave the acceleration. 500 divided by 250 is simply 2. So the acceleration of that object would be 2 meters per second squared. So if you flip your notes over, now you've got on the back side of your notes, we've got one more law to cover, sometimes called Newton's third law. In the state of Texas, we refer to it as the law of action reaction. In this law, whenever one object exerts a force on a second object, the second object is going to exert an equal and opposite force back on that first object. So to help you out with this, think about it like this. For law of action and reaction, forces are always produced in pairs and they will always be opposite direction and equal strengths. So if you think about it, like drawing a force diagram, if you had 10 newtons to the left, if that was your first force, then there's gotta be a force 10 newtons to the right as the second force. A really classic example of this is a balloon. As we fill a balloon up with air and we open it, there's an action. And the action is the air rushes down out of the balloon and the equal and opposite force cause a reaction and the balloon goes the other direction, it goes up. Other good examples you can use, roller skating or skateboarding. A lot of times you think about it, when you're doing either one, if you're doing a little bit of skateboarding and you put your right foot down on the ground, you're gonna step and press behind you and you're gonna have the skateboard and you go the opposite direction. Action, reaction. You could also do this if you're pushing off a wall. A rocket launching is another classic example. Just like the balloon, the gas goes one way, the balloon will go the other. A rocket will do the same. As those engines fire, all the gas goes down and the rocket launches the other direction. We had the balloon example we just looked at. Another good example of this is if you put your arm over a table and you release a tennis ball. The tennis ball will hit the ground and the ground's gonna hit the ball back and press the ball back up. Another really cool one is if you put your hand out and you lean against a wall. That means you are one object and the wall is the other. So it basically means the wall is pushing back on you. And sometimes that's a hard one to think about, but it has to be true. If the wall didn't push back on you, you would fall straight through the wall. But that doesn't happen. Therefore, we know the wall is pushing back on you just as hard as you are pushing on the wall. If you got to see Newton's cradle, this is another great example. This is the one that has the five orbs that are suspended from strings. And if you let one orb go off and slam into the whole entire stack, one flies off the other end, equal and opposite. If you pull two orbs back and you let it fly into it, two orbs fly off the other side, equal and opposite. Now there's one more thing we should probably talk about before we quit this, and that is just the idea of friction. For a lot of these examples, and especially like the law of inertia, a lot of people say, now wait a minute. If I get a tennis ball rolling across the floor, according to the law of inertia, it's going to roll in a straight line forever. But we know that doesn't happen. Why? Well, the reason is there's a fighting force that's slowing it down, and that would be friction. Uh, this is also a good way to think about the planets. Our planet Earth 
if it could hurl through space without any other gravity of anything else near it would always go in a straight line. But if it ever ran into any kind of friction to slow it down or a fighting force, it would change it. So for friction, it's just that. It's a force that resists motion between two touching surfaces. It acts in the opposite direction of the object's motion. So if your skateboard is going to the right, friction is fighting it and pushing to the left and slowing you down. Now friction does produce a little bit of heat and this is where some of that energy goes. If you think about other units you're going to study later, you know you can't destroy energy, but it can move around in different ways. So even your skateboard wheels, as they're moving, even if the bearings are really good, there's still friction and it's still going to produce a little bit of heat and steal some of that energy from you. Okay, that is it for this tutorial, guys. Don't forget your summary. That's probably the most important part and how your teacher is going to know that you've gone through this. Good luck.